Thank you, Carl. And good morning. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I'm, I'm one of your patients. I live in Northern Ireland, so uh, I'm going to try and say nice things so you treat me well when I go through your, uh, through your hands. Um, I'll make a few remarks today, and, uh, and I think I'll, I'm trying to both provoke you, so allow me to do that, but also uh, work with the energy that you bring. Uh, I think you should be very proud of the work that you do every single day, and at the same time, uh, I think you should not forget about yourself in the process of doing so. I think caring for ourselves is a, is a very important task that we often overlook. Uh, so let me start by saying that we're all observers in the world, that's what the O stands for, that take actions, and those actions lead us to some results. What we tend to do is we tend to change the actions in order to achieve different results. And we overlook the possibility of changing the observers that we are uh, in the world. So the invitation today is just to uh, think about how we continuously need to look at ourselves in the mirror uh, to, to uh, really uh, insightfully digest the reality that is that we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are, and we all bring something wonderful to the world and then we all we all have challenges and things that we can improve so scarcity and abundance let me start with a world map and tell you a couple of stories the, the first one is to say i think you're very lucky in addition to being privileged uh, just from a workforce point of view the numbers that you have here are amongst the highest in the world that's a world map where the darker uh, the color the higher the number you're in the top 15% of the world in terms of uh, numbers. Uh, and I see uh, I've been in the last two months, I've been in Peru, in Portugal, in Brazil, working with groups like yours, and I hear two sides of a story. One is, a, is, a, is when, the light, when the eyes lit up, light up, so they, they talk with pride about the things that they've done, the things they've achieved, the difference they're making for patients, the things that bring them joy inside of work, and then outside of work as well. And on the flip side, I hear a lot of, uh, let, me, let me use a technical term here, bitching and complaining about things. I don't have enough resources, and this is hard, and this person is really pissing me off. There are some patients that I, that I really struggle with. And on and on and on and on and on. So proportionately, I think, uh, the fact that I come from outside means that they initially tell me the good stories, and once we get to know each other, they start to get into the, the, the tricky stuff. And it tends to go on for longer than the good stories. So if we think about scarcity, and if we frame our life around scarcity, we will go into our daily lives um, interpreting that. So let me tell you a couple of stories of, of abundance that I think are important for us to, to put things into perspective. Last Christmas, I, I had the privilege of spending time with a family. The, the father of that family is a, is a loving, super loving guy, Guillermo, um, Germán, and Mariana are his three kids. And um, he is the president of a large financial institution in one of the South American countries. Two years ago, he was kidnapped. He was kidnapped, so he was his freedom. He was deprived of his freedom. He was taken to a to a room that was two by two. It was dark. There were no windows. There was a there was a space through the door where he got some food when when they felt like giving him food. And he spent eleven months in this place. Eleven months in a two by two room with no window. When Herman tells a story, as he did by pure coincidence of life uh, a couple of months ago in the Vatican. Um, you learn a lot. Um, I, I tried not to talk about it when we were together, at the, but this is roughly what happened. Over the first seven months as they were negotiating the ransom amount and so on, uh, he asked for one thing. Uh, he's a religious man, so he he asked for the Bible because he thought that by reading that and by focusing on the inside on his thoughts and by uh, recognizing and appreciating the fact that he still had his thoughts and no one could take that away from him. Uh, and the pride that that meant, um, 
uh, meant that the Bible was one way of staying sane. He felt ambiguously well, actually, as he describes it, ambiguously well because he felt terrible that he was away from his family and wondered what they were feeling because he was feeling a lot of pain because he was away. He felt refreshed because he had space to read and think uh, and reflect. Imagine seven months in a two by two dark room and you feel refreshed. Abundance or scarcity? After seven months of negotiations, uh, nothing was happening, so they took the Bible away from him. So he was left with his thoughts. And even then, he learned to appreciate uh, the value of that. And when he came out, he chose to forgive. This conference he was speaking at at the Vatican was about forgiveness. So uh, no, religion, no religious overtones for sure. Uh, but the story of, of Herman reminds me continuously that we need to, we, we have the opportunity, because this is a choice of, uh, of living from a position of abundance and not scarcity. So next time you think about uh, complaining and, and, uh, and whining, which we all need to do at some point, group therapy is good, individual therapy is good as well, uh, think about abundance and the opportunity that lives with that. And remember that not doing so, uh, can lead to behaviors that are not the kinds of behaviors that, that we want with our patients, with our friends and colleagues, with our families and so on. So we, we somehow get into these cycles of normalizing deviance. So we see behaviors that shouldn't happen and we, we just normalize them because circumstances are so tough that that's okay to do. And uh, we build norms that are not uh, the right norms. So the opportunity of thinking uh, from the perspective of abundance goes way, way beyond uh, just, a nice, just a nice thought or, or a nice way of seeing the world. I think it opens up a number of possibilities for us to continuously re-energize, because this work is tired. If I, if, I, if I walk around tables and I sit down with, with you and we talk for five minutes, I will learn and I know that in advance that you're working very, very hard uh, to provide amazing care for people for the people of uh, Northern Ireland. A couple, a couple more things about abundance. Uh, the size of Northern Ireland provides for a spectacular place to, to, to have health and health care delivered in a, in a world-class manner. Uh, the ratio of health professionals to population is, is abundant. Uh, even the conditions under which you work, if, if you compare them, again, Peru and Brazil, for instance, if you compare basic things, like salary, and annual leave, and all this stuff, the conditions are pretty, pretty solid. There's, there's, I'm sure there's always room for improvement, but we live in abundance. We live in abundance, and I think being grateful for that, it's, um, it's important. So that's that's my starting point is abundance, and and the second one is that we teach, we work uh, very hard to build system awareness and to teach, uh, you know process mapping and systems uh, improvement, and we know that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. Avidis or Avidian was one of the uh, key professors of improvement alongside Schur and Deming, talked about the need, the need to go beyond. It, it is the ethical dimensions of individuals that are essential to a system's success. Ultimately, the secret of quality is love. I love that. He talks about the pace of improvement being majestic. I love that as well. There's, there's, there's a huge amount of satisfaction in, in going beyond the transactional of designing systems and learning techniques and so on and doing the best that we can and doing it with and from a position of, uh, of love. So let me, let me paint the picture of the context and then give you three opportunities to work from abundance in the generation of love, let's, let's, let's frame it that way. So this is the world that we live in, and this is converging globally. I'd say I'm not speaking here for Northern Ireland only, but for many places around the world. The first one is that if I ask you if you have a relative or a friend that's, that's alive or that's lived to over 80 years of age, I'd probably get the majority of the room putting their hands up. So the, the, the demographic pyramid is changing. It's changing, and that could be seen as a challenge, it is, and as an opportunity to leverage the assets that this group of people that we've never had before in the numbers that we have uh, bring to our society. So the first 
uh, trigger for goodness or challenge in our current uh, world is the changing demographics, the changing uh, epidemiology of what we're seeing. Chronic conditions now are part of our daily life. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and on and on and on. And that presents a different challenge uh, because of the system that we built 50 years ago to take care of sick patients uh, is not necessarily what we need to take care of people who have lifelong conditions. This one's, I don't, need, I don't, I don't need to talk much about money because we all know uh, the challenges with uh, constrained resources. The fourth one is um, what I call salutogenesis, which is the need to co-develop, co-produce, and co-design health. Not care, health. How do we do that? I'm encouraged, Carol, by the fact that you have health-producing staffers out there, and you're inviting people to go for a walk, and so on. And this conference is about being fit for caring. So it's, uh, it's hugely encouraging. We need to take that into the way that we think about our work. Uh, producing health is, a, is as important as, as it is uh, to, to work on the cure. Patient safety continues to be a challenge and will always be a challenge as we continue to reflect on the reliability of our system. Engaging patients meaningfully or citizens meaningfully in their own health is a huge challenge. The, the, the possibilities that technology opens up, and this is in Spanish, but the word is pretty self-explanatory, they continuously now are imperative to be transparent. So this, this is the world that we live in. I'd say, I talked in, in Peru a couple of weeks ago, in Brazil a month ago, in Portugal three months ago, and the, the, the situation looks pretty, pretty similar in those countries. And uh, there's an acknowledgement now that health is produced by many things beyond what we do. Can you find health care there? One, two, three, four. It's in the fourth, uh, it's in the fourth uh, space there on the, on the right hand side. Uh, so the production of health and the impact of health care on health is not as big as we once thought for sure, how we live, how we love, what we do, and on and on and on are more important than healthcare. So we need to do well in healthcare, but we also need to consider that it's, it's, it's about much more than that. So let me, let me tell you uh, a story uh, that, I, that I'm borrowing from my friend and colleague Don Berwick about a bridge. This is Honduras. And in Honduras, um, there was the need to build a bridge over the Choluteca River. This, is, uh, this, is, this was important for, uh, for the economy of the, of the place, for the tourism, and on and on and on. And once it was built in 1938, it got a lot of use. In 1996, it was remodeled by a Japanese and American group that built a pretty sexy bridge, the kind of bridge uh, that, that we have on the way down to Dublin. And so modern, stable, built to survive many things. In 1998, there was a hurricane that devastated Honduras. It, it really took uh, most of the country down, and it, and it took a while for it to, to come back up. And this particular region was affected heavily. The bridge survived. The bridge survived. It had only been remodeled or rebuilt two years before, but the river moved. So we've built a very strong bridge in our hospitals, in our primary care centers, in the facilities that we, that we have. But the river is moving. The river is moving. People are getting older. Um, chronic conditions are part of the norm. We have limited resources, and on and on and on. Unless we internalize that and work with it, uh, we, we will have a bridge for a river that has moved and we will be living in a world that, that we can shape and that we choose not to shape. Um, in that context, there's what I like to call the illusion of control. There's a New England Journal uh, of Medicine article that talks about 5,000 wake hours. So any patient that, for instance, has a chronic condition is awake 5,000 hours per year. How long do they spend with us, with the health system, health and social care system, let's call it? Maybe 15 hours, 20 hours, let's say 50, 50 hours. The rest of the time they're living uh, their lives 
And so are the rest of our citizens, for sure. As things get worse, so they have a car crash, and they need to come to A&E, and they need to have a surgery. They have cancer, and, and, and on and on and on. The control comes into play as the acuity uh, increases. But other than that, health is in their hands. So we need to internalize and acknowledge that that's the case, and that's a river that's, that's moving. I'll bring an example from Singapore, just in terms of some of the things that are happening. And I have to say, here in Northern Ireland, there are many things happening to, to help us continue to build that bridge to overcome the next bridge. But let me, let me share with you what our friends from Singapore, one of our strategic partners at the national level, are doing in the north part. Uh, this is the north part. And they, they make an analogy that they borrowed from, from Alaska, from South Central Foundation and Nuka, where if you, if you think about a stone and you think about a, an aim and you try and throw the stone to hit the center of that aim, you probably, with a bit of practice, can get it right because you can pretty much predict the flight of that stone and, and measure uh, from your throw how it's going to get there and how it's going to fly. If you had the opportunity to grab a, a bird very gently and try and throw it to hit the same aim, the bird will fly anywhere that it wants. And that's the analogy that they make around control. So low control uh, in terms of the bird and high control in terms of the stone. So they've built a system where they've flipped a number of things. The first one is they had a number of teams, uh, teams that served 150,000 households in the north of Singapore. They have flipped that. Now they have 150 households that are the core team, and they integrate into that team, into the existing team. So now they have 150,000 teams that have been formed for the lifetime of that family, and they integrate into that. So low control, the need for integration, and from a measurement perspective, what we're trying to think through is acknowledging that we have a customer for life and we need to predict and pre prevent and build relationships of trust. Relationships of trust so, so that when we have control, we already know them well, they already trust us, and they know that we're going to do the best we, we, uh, we can for them. This is about building a, a, or the, helping them have a good quality of life and um, understanding their assets as a family, as a, as a community, and facilitating networks so that that happens almost organically with a little bit of uh, design thinking. On the other hand, though, they do need to come into our institution. So when we have high control, we need to treat them better, faster, cheaper, and safer. And you know that, I know that. So the indicators or the, or the KPIs uh, become about uh, providing the highest quality and safety that we can, so that we can get them out there, so that they can live within their own resources, leverage their own assets, and so on. In Nuka, where they've been doing this for years, actually, with an indigenous population, in Alaska, they've, they've achieved some pretty spectacular results around what I would call today uh, the triple aim, which is a simultaneous pursuit of better health, better care, at lower cost which is the direction of travel of many health systems, including the one in Northern Ireland. Better health, better care, and lower cost. The, the pursuit of the triple aim. Uh, so let me offer three opportunities of, now that, now that we've set some sort of context, of um, generating love from a position of abundance. So seeing this class not have empty, but have food. And the first one is within each of us. And it's leveraging empathy, um, which, I will start by showing you, and this went all over the place, I'm not sure why. I will start by showing you a video, but when I clicked on the next slide, it offered to recycle the presentation. There we are. So if we can dim the lights for a couple of minutes, I want to I wanna show you this video. Let me give you the context very quickly. Cleveland Clinic is a pretty well-known institution globally, and their chief executive was struggling with understanding or getting across to everyone that worked in the system that empathy was hugely, hugely important. So this is, this is what they came up with. And that is not showing. Joyce of technology. Are you?
She used to tell me, and it used to write me up. She used to say, "Mi amor," as she called me. Uh, would you listen with empathy? Just listen with empathy. I, I didn't want to listen for sure. <laughs> I thought I thought I knew better. Uh, I thought I had all the right answers. Uh, but listening with empathy, and, and then one day the, the sort of the, the penny dropped in my head, and I understood what she what she meant. That's my that's my mom on the left side. Um, the importance of listening with empathy. Um, so the emotion there is what? Can somebody shout it out? And the emotion here is? And the one here? And all of those things are contagious. All of those things are contagious. So there's a there's a lot of research on on uh, on the way that our brain works that talk about uh, that talks about mirror neurons. So when we come across someone, the the reaction if you're a receiver of of this face, your demeanor will probably be defensive, unless you practice meditation and, and sort of can take that in a in a pretty uh, lenient way. The reaction here is that you probably connect, somebody will connect with your sadness and some opportunity here that someone will connect with your, with your joy. There's for sure a dynamic coherence, and this is stuff from ontological coaching. I've uh, been working with an organization that has a global presence in this space and learned a huge deal about the connection between the body, the way our body reacts and behaves, the language that we use, and it's language which for sure generates uh, a reality, creates distinctions, uh, and becomes part of our history. Think about the people that you're surrounded by every day. They use a certain kind of language which is either optimistic or pessimistic or positive or encouraging or not encouraging, and on and on and on. Language is hugely, hugely important in the way that we portray ourselves and the way that we affect the environment that we live in, and so it is so our emotions. Uh, and, 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 and remember, and this is hugely important, learning uh, in an emotional context doesn't respond to command only. Because the limbic system where the emotions are hosted learns not by instruction, but by immersion. So it's by doing the leadership that you portray or display on a daily basis, by doing it's more important that what you can transmit through a memo or an email or a note or a, or a mandate to do something or a regulation. We learn by immersion. 
we learn by immersion. So ha having in mind, in terms of empathy, how we need to take care of this dynamic coherence of the body and language and emotions is hugely important. And it brought uh, back the, the, the memory of Dan Heath's book. Uh, Dan came to Brazil with us a few weeks ago, and, and they wrote a book called Switch About Change. And he talks essentially about the elephant, the elephant, the emotional side of us, the writer, the rational side of us, and the need to direct the writer, be clear about where we want to go to, triple aim, motivate the elephant, work with emotions, uh, and go beyond just the transactional side of, of things, and shape the path. We have a responsibility as leaders to, to do that. If the big elephant and the little writer were to have a fight, who is going to win? Emotions trump reason most of the time. So let's make sure that we keep that in mind as we consider empathy and the possibility of, of, uh, of abundance. Of course, the limbic system has the capacity to regulate. It has the capacity of revising itself. So when somebody tells you that you're grumpy, you might have been grumpy at some point, but that doesn't mean that you're grumpy all the time. We have the capacity to revise who we are continuously. Continuously. And resonance. Resonance is this thing that happens between two people somewhere that's similar to the mirror neurons, where if you come with a demeanor, you're likely to affect the other person. So if we come grumpy, complaining, bitching about other things that don't work, we likely infect others with that. If we come with the joy of abundance and the possibility of feeling privileged, of being able to work with patients and communities and so on to make a difference to their health, then we transmit something very, very, very differently. Uh, very differently. So let's let's uh, let's consider let's leverage empathy and start by self. -care. So it's hard to be empathic when you don't feel well. Uh, that's about taking care of your own health. That's about doing the things that you love inside and outside of work. Uh, that's about eating whatever uh, works for your system and so on. For me. Football is, a, is an outlet, and, and, and this is a, a, a sad reminder of, of my initial football coach, Valdemar, who's on the right-hand side of the picture, who died about two weeks ago. He brought back millions of amazing memories, but it also made me realize how much he shaped my life, because I learned by doing uh, through, a, through a sport. So for me, self-caring uh, is as much about doing sports and playing football, for instance, as about trying to do a good job every day. Empathy with your loved ones. It's important not to forget our, the balance in our lives with our patients and with the people that are sitting here in this room right now, with your colleagues. So as we think about abundance and generating love through abundance, do the job that we have to do, let's leverage empathy. The second thing I'll invite you to do is to use data for learning. And this, this, is, a, this is a story of a couple. So let's say these are John and Mary. Um, Mary works at a company, she takes public the, the transport of the company to get back home and uh, she, she roughly arrives around 7 o'clock. So over the last two weeks John's been away but she's been, she's been sort of tracking the times that she arrives. And here's the here's way this looks, the zero is 7 o'clock, this is 7.05 and this is 6.55 and so on. So day one Mary arrives at 10 past 7, day 2, 5, 5, 2, 7, day 3 at 7, day 4, day 5, and so on. So we understand that there's a pattern to the way that she, to the times that she arrives home. Um, now, we have, now we can create a reference, which is roughly what time she arrives, which is 7 o'clock, and limits. So if, if, if she goes over or under, that there's something happening that's not, that's not normal. So John comes back from... Uh, from holiday and she comes home at 6.50 and John asks the question so how come you told me you arrived most of the time at 7 you're, you're early 6.50 what, what's going on is everything okay and she arrives at 7 and he says yesterday you arrived at 6.50 and now you're arriving at 7 what the hell is going on and the next day she arrives at 7.05 Mary are you not so what 7.05 Yesterday you arrived at 7 and now you're arriving at 7.05. 
And next day she arrives at 5 to 7, and John says, Mary, seriously? Are you taking the piss here, or what's, what's the story? Is it 7, or 5 to 7, or 10 to 7, or what? Um, I'm not sure I, I understand. And we could go on and on and on, um, talking about this bizarre behavior. The question is, what do we do with John? <laughs> and better yet, what do we do with Mary? We're taking that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we tend to see our systems in a static way. So we tend to behave like John. So we see the red, we tell people what the hell are you doing. We see the green, happy days. We see the yellow, so-so. Let's move on. Without understanding the variation, reacting to a system on a static way provides many, 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 many challenges and many behaviors that we, in the eyes of John or Mary, would consider as a little crazy. So when, we, when I say use data for learning, uh, what I mean is uh, that we need to digest the fact that life is very easy. So as you stand there and you're looking at me, your heart's beating at a certain rate, it's not exactly the same every time. Your, your blood's flowing at a certain, it's not exactly the same at a certain, our body, our physiology, it's variation. Our moods are variation. How did you get up this morning? I'll get some of you that got up with their left foot and they're a little grumpy, didn't sleep well last night, and some of you that are ecstatic because you were coming to hear Charlotte and Nikki and other people. Um, our mood is variation. Uh, our daily patterns are variation. We live at a certain time, we arri arrive at a certain time, whatever that is, but there, are, there is variation. Our life is not fully predictable. And we need to acknowledge that as a system in order to behave in a way that's conducive to learning and to conversations that are productive and leading to growth. So John tells Mary, hey, I'd love to have some private time uh, so that we could both get fit, maybe do a little bit of gym at 6.30. Is there anything that you can do to get there? When we designed this exercise, we did it in Sao Paulo where the traffic is awful. So uh, Mary says, yeah, maybe I can buy a helicopter or something to get my home <laughs> time. In reality, uh, Mary went to the company and said, hey, can I work a different pattern? Uh, because I'd like to change a few things in my personal life. Is, is that possible? I keep working as hard, as much, but I want to change my life. So they, they changed the process of work and the process of transfer. So this is what happens. He started to get home at a time that allowed them to go to the gym together because that's happiness and that's important and so on. So now the process changed and we need to change. We need to change the way we understand the way our system behaves. So we change the mean and we change the limit. Not, not hard to understand as a principle. If, um, if Mary goes beyond the red either way, we understand that something's going on and we call in a caring way to say, hey, are you okay? Is everything working out? We're using this globally. This is an effort to reduce C-sections in Brazil. Data is a couple of months old. Uh, but it's a, it, it, it opens up the possibility for a very different conversation where you can sit down every week or every month and talk about the variation in the system and say, how, how do we reduce the variation so that we can predict how we behave uh, and uh, how do we help each other to continuously improve the world that we, that we live in. So leverage, leverage data and use data for learning. The last point I want to I wanna talk about is, is uh, this Wonderful word, but tricky word, innovation. Let's demystify innovation. Let's demystify it. We're, we're not talking about discovering a new pharmaceutical drug. Not at all. The kind of innovation that we need, that you, that you are leading in your systems, it's much simpler than that. It's about empowering people. It's about using, uh, using data as market. And it's about asking the people that are leading the work in the front line what the solutions are and our citizens and our kids, the combination of that. So let me give you an example of, of what demystifying innovation is. We had a challenge in Chile where we're working with 80 schools, kids three to five, so the equivalent of uh, P1s and P2s here. And, um, and one of the challenges that we had initially when we started four years ago is that these kids were drinking a lot of sugar drinks, either juices or Coca-Cola, which were very cheap, as cheap as water. And we asked the teachers and we asked the kids, what do we need to do to, to help you? 
do what's right, which is to drink a little bit of water. So our aim was to decrease the consumption of sugar drinks and uh, decrease the consumption of sugar drinks and increase the consumption of water. And we would measure a number of things around that. So we we asked them, what did they say? They said, uh, we don't have it available in our schools, so can you make a pitcher of water or a jug of water available in the classrooms? And can we provide kids with cups, plastic cups? So not a huge amount of resources, pretty intuitive. <laughs> But we didn't have the answers, they did. Um, you need to communicate to parents that, that, uh, that this stuff of drinking sugary drinks is not great for their kids. And we can use this to teach kids about, uh, about the triangles and the circles and the squares and so on, and about counting, because they can measure their own thing. So this is what happened. In a couple of classrooms, as we were learning, we made a pitcher of water available, we put cups, we put uh, some beads in the middle, and they would put beads on top of their geometrical figure and their little picture on the right-hand side if they drank water, on the left-hand side if they drank it. Not rocket science. This is innovation. Contextual innovation in their context, for sure. For sure. They wanted to go beyond that, so it was not just in the classroom when they went out for lunch. There wasn't water available, so can you serve water for lunch and eliminate all other options? For sure. And can you find a way of conveying the concept so that kids can really understand and internalize what it means uh, in their body? So this is what happened. There's a plant on the, on the right-hand side that was fed with Coca-Cola, one in the middle that was fed with nothing, and one in the left that was fed with water. Who do you think behaved best? Who do you think grew better? How do you think the kids understood this as opposed to a scientific explanation? We were attacking the elephant, not the rider. We were clear in the direction of travel. The aim was to reduce the consumption of sugary drinks and increase the consumption of water. So let's demystify innovation. You have the power and most of the answers that we need in combination with our patients and citizens to get to the solution to the challenges that we have in order to move the bridge, to cross the river that we need to cross, and pursue the AAA. Better care, better health, a lower cost. And when I say it's not rocket science, I, I really mean it. So I have a one minute uh, video to show you the interpretation of, a, of an eight year old, of a, of a seven year old at the time of this. So. Okay, well done, Sophia. So you can you can do the yeah, the recording. Okay. So how many seconds was that? Okay. So here you are. You just did it. So tell tell us a little bit about this graph. What what do these numbers here mean? The time. So it'll be seventy seconds, sixty seconds, and so on. Okay. And what about these numbers here at the bottom? What are they? How many times you did it? So first time, the second time, the third time. And what are these little numbers of here then? It means, they mean the seconds and how much you've done. And the last one I did was 19 seconds. 19 seconds. And what is this dotted line here? This dotted line? That's my goal. And what, what was your goal for the three times two? 20. Below 20. Below 20 seconds. <laughs> and something happened here. You got 61 seconds, as you said. And then something happened, all of a sudden you moved and all these little dots are down here. What happened? Um, there was some I learned and it helped me to get the faster tattoo. A song? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to sing the song on this camera, but was it good? Was the song good? Yeah. Okay, and you seem to have improved, so you've got the last four being under 20? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for sharing with us how you use the rock charts to learn. Okay, you want to say bye? Bye! <laughs> <laughs> so this is my, my daughter Sophia uh, learning to, uh, to get the three times table. When I asked her what needed to happen, she said, Daddy, this is boring. Seriously. Three times one is three, three times one. I can't do this. I love music and we find the song. So we went on to YouTube, we found a couple of songs. She liked one.
She listened to it, she learned the thing, and she improved significantly. Innovation, the answer was within her. I have no idea. Within her. So let's leverage empathy. This is within every one of your, um, it's within every one of you. Let's use data for learning. Let's not behave like John and Mary. Um, and let's demystify innovation. Let's learn from these kids in terms of what's possible around innovation. Um, we need to dare. In order to change norms, we need to dare. Uh, does anybody remember the old brick? <laughs> that was a cool thing to have at the time. You were cool if you had this monster. The floppy disks, and then the computers without color. And then this one, this one you'll know for sure. The tapes, right? And what did we listen to the tapes in? That was a personal thing if you went for a walk. A walkman. A walkman, right? Cool thing. And then after the walkman, what came? Huge innovation, right? The disk. And now we do all of that here. All of it, and more, and more. And we don't miss the brick. We don't miss the floppy disk. We don't miss the disk map. We have something that's better. So we need to change the norm to build a system that's better. That's better. Uh, and we need to commit. These are the 80 chief executives that came to the pre-day in the Latin American forum where we had around 2,000 people, and they committed explicitly. They wrote their commitment, they took a selfie, and they shared it with their organizations and the world. In fact, I'm showing you here what they committed to, so you can hold them to account in a friendly way, in a learning way, in a shared learning way. Uh, so good luck. Thank you for, for having me. It's a privilege to be here, and good luck with the rest of the conference and your daily lives. Take care of yourselves.